Okay, we'll go ahead and begin the program tonight. I want to thank everybody for joining us on this webinar uh, here tonight to talk about updates and communicating with your family about the BRCA mutation. Uh, my name is Jim West. I'm a lawyer here in northern Kentucky and greater Cincinnati. And I'll tell you a little bit about the organization as we proceed through the night. The agenda for tonight's program is, like I said, I'll talk a little bit about the organization, Check Your Genes, and then we have two genetic counselors that will be presenting about communicating BRAC results, BRCA1 and 2 results, uh, to the family members. Uh, the first presenter is Sarah Kanapke. She's a certified genetic counselor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, and she'll be talking about communicating BRCA1 and 2 results um, as part of the program. The second presenter is Kristen Theobald. She's also a certified genetic counselor here at St. Elizabeth Healthcare in Northern Kentucky. And she'll be talking about the new and exciting family history notification tool that Check Your Genes recently added to its website. Uh, it's a process in which family members, it's a process in which people who have been uh, diagnosed with this genetic mutation can seamlessly notify family members of the results and provide them accurate medical information on what to do with those results. Uh, at the end of the program, we'll reserve some time for questions and answers. And along the way, if you have any questions, there should be a chat box on your screen. Just type in your question in the chat box. We'll try to answer, answer it as we go through the program tonight. But if we don't get to that question, uh, we'll certainly address it in the question and answer segment at the end of the program. why we're here. Let me provide you a little bit of, about the history of Check Your Genes. Check Your Genes um, was formed after my sister was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2001. And I need to take you a little bit back in our family so you can get that diagnosis of ovarian cancer in context. My mom died of breast cancer at the age of 49. Her sister, my aunt, died of breast cancer in her 40s. My sister and I, Nancy's seen in this picture, we knew breast cancer ran in our family, but we didn't know what to do with that information. We didn't know about genetic testing. So when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and the doctor found out that our mom and our aunt had both died of breast cancer. The doctor said, you probably have the BRCA gene. You should, have you been tested? My sister said, what test? It was at that point that we realized there was a communication problem. There was a problem with getting accurate information out to the public and encouraging those families that have that family history to go and seek genetic counseling and get this life-saving genetic test. So we began working with the genetic counselors at our local hospitals, Cincinnati Children's Hospital and St. Elizabeth Healthcare, to figure out what we could do as a small grassroots nonprofit organization to try to educate the public on this life-saving test. And what we did was we thought we could do that the best through getting the word out directly to the public. Similar to what drug companies do with their advertisements that you see on the nightly news every night. They ask you if you have a history of some disease. So we thought we'd ask the public, does breast or ovarian cancer run in your family? If it does, then you need to get this test. You need to go to a genetic counselor and seek out medical advice because you're at a you could potentially be at a significantly increased risk for developing breast and ovarian cancer. So that's why we formed this local nonprofit organization and we found the most effective and cost effective way of getting the word out was through the internet. So our website we had a website developed and we partnered with St. Elizabeth Healthcare and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We put genetic counselors on our board of directors 
and we wanted to do that so we would have accurate medical information going on our website. Our website is tops whenever you search for BRCA, uh, if you search for genetic uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer, our website pops up and it's accurate medical information. So that's the history. So after my sister was diagnosed, she wanted to make sure that this wouldn't happen to anybody else. She wanted to try to save lives and that's why we formed the organization. Unfortunately, my sister lost her battle to cancer at the age of 40. She died in 2009. However, the board of directors and our local organization and our connections at the hospitals decided this was an important cause, something that we needed to keep going even though my sister had died. So we agreed to keep the organization open and active and we're still to this day trying to ask people out there in the public, does breast or, or ovarian cancer run in your family? If so, it's important for you to get ch tested. So what we've been doing recently is trying to identify uh, people who need to, need to have this information. And one of the groups that we figured out pretty early on needed to have this information would be family members of people who have tested positive for this genetic change. We think there's a real disconnect between a family member getting tested and that family member notifying the other potentially affected family members of their diagnosis. So we wanted to make it seamless. We wanted to make it easy. Thus, the family notification tool that's on our website. So educating the public will save lives and that's what we're all about. There's the mission to educate the public and healthcare professionals on the need for a formal genetic risk assessment and testing if an individual has a family history of breast and ovarian cancer. I explained before our partnership with genetic counselors in the area. I think it's critical that we have medically accurate information and we share a common goal of saving lives and educating the public. As I mentioned before, Sarah Kanapke, a certified genetic counselor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, will begin the first part of this presentation. This will be followed by Kristen Theobald. So I'm going to turn over the controls to Sarah. And let's see. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Let's see, I'm going to get my slides going here. I'm happy to uh, be here and to be partnering with Check Your Genes. It's been a real pleasure to work with an organization that feels so passionate about things that we talk with patients about on a daily basis. So we really appreciate them, um, uh, you know, just allowing us to be a part of the exciting things that Check Your Genes is doing. So I thought we'd spend some time today talking about um, making sure that you have or feel armed with information. If you're someone who has tested positive for a BRCA mutation, feel armed with information to be able to communicate effectively with your family members. So um, we'll start first by, you know, talking about what happens after a BRCA positive test. And, you know, some people are um, working with the genetic counselor through this process, and I hope that the genetic counselor in those situations has given you the resources you need to feel comfortable and armed with this. Um, uh, task of uh, talking with family members um, and with also moving forward with your own medical management. Um, but, you know, others may not be working specifically with a genetic specialist. They may have a very knowledgeable healthcare provider. Others may need to seek out a genetic specialist or other very knowledgeable healthcare provider to help them through this process. So after someone uh, has a positive BRCA1 or 2 genetic test, it's certainly information. You know, a lot of times people are coming in for the testing because they know that it will impact other adults in their family. Um, but we know for sure that it also has impact on the care for that particular patient in a lot of cases. It may not, um, but in a lot of cases it may. So some of the things that the individual as well as their healthcare, or excuse me, as well as their relatives may be interested in learning about are what are the options for instance for um, increased surveillance um, for lifestyle changes that may help to modify the risk associated with these gene mutations. Um, are there options for prevention? 
and also uh, through surgery or through medication. And so we'll talk a bit about each of these things um, so that you feel like you have uh, the most up-to-date information about it. Like I said, it, I think it's preferable. I'm a little bit biased because I am a genetic counselor, but I think it's preferable certainly um, if you can work with a, a genetic specialist, a, a certified or licensed genetic counselor. Um, you know, I think that can help um, enhance your assessment as well as um, provide you with great resources for your family. First of all, a certified genetic counselor looks at family histories every day um, to try to identify the patterns that will help us know whether someone is at increased risk for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome or BRCA mutations, or whether there's a different hereditary cancer syndrome that may be at play. Or a genetic counselor may also be able to provide an individual with reassurance about a family history if the risk is not high for there being a hereditary cause in the family for the cancers. Um, certainly a genetic counselor can walk through the unique variations in testing that's available and the uh, up-to-date, as I mentioned, management options for hereditary cancer risk. Um, there uh, are a variety of tests, a variety of methods for doing the testing um, that can be important. Um, the testing has also been updated over time, so it's important to make sure if someone's had testing that it's the appropriate test in that person or family. Also can um, discuss the utilization of the net genetic testing and actual management for the oncology conditions, particularly for that patient, for instance, and how it may impact their care right away. Um, and again, um, I think genetic counselors are sort of uniquely poised to provide you with information uh, to share with your family and how it may impact the whole family. Key, key concepts to communication in this setting, certainly I think it's helpful to um, develop a plan for sharing your results. You feel really prepared um, before you uh, take this information to your family. You may be the first in your family to be tested and really be um, sort of uh, tasked with sharing this information with all those who may be at risk. Um, and that may feel like a burden, but we're hoping that after today you feel like you, um, you know, can really use that information to um, use this information to feel empowered to share all this with your family members. So I think it's, you know, important to, you know, some people say, well, I'm really not in contact with that relative. I really, uh, we don't get along well. There's been a, you know, rift in the family, that kind of thing. And I think we always encourage patients to think about the importance of how life-saving this information could be to people in the family. Um, and that from an ethical perspective, we really encourage uh, patients to share the information with all those who can be impacted. Um, it is important, though, for those who um, uh, are within a family to respect one another's decisions about when or when not to be tested. Um, someone may not be as ready for the information as others were in the family. And also to anticipate some potential changes, even temporary or permanent, with regard to the family dynamics. So um, those who, uh, you know, a negative test is not always um, a very um, positive experience for someone in the family. People may have survivor guilt if they're one of, you know, some of the people in the family who didn't inherit this risk as they've watched other people in the family go through the burden of cancer. If they're sort of off the hook um, with regard to risk, it, it, may, it may cause some feelings of guilt. Also, feelings of guilt of passing this on to family members um, can be an issue. And then uh, certainly it can just, again, change family relationships. Um, you know, people may start um, you know, just feeling differently. This is not just a medical issue, but it's an emotional issue as well. So what information should you share with your family? Certainly family history information is important. Um, people may be unaware of the, the, the breadth or the depth of the cancers that have happened in the family, and you may be the one who's sort of put all that together in working with the healthcare provider or your genetic counselor um, and really, you know, come up with the family tree and, and um, been the first to, to really make that all cohesive. So, and those who may not be as sort of closely knit um, or as who maybe weren't around when this information was being shared um, just may not be as, as familiar. So it's important to share the accurate family history as well. Um, certainly the type of testing that you had done um, and the results that came out of that testing. And in some cases, you might be the first to be able to guide them to accurate information about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. It's important, again, for you to feel prepared and, and feel like you have these resources in play. Not that you need to take the place of a, uh, someone who you know, is in the healthcare field who's knowledgeable about this, but again, um, if this is very brand new information to a family member, you might be uniquely poised for that. 
So um, certainly I think sharing the risk information in the family. So um, if, if they uh, you know, haven't had cancer themselves or their parent hasn't had cancer, they may not be aware that this can um, be something that people have but ha who haven't had cancer, um, even if uh, you know, maybe they still are at risk. Um, so important to, to recognize that people just may not put those pieces together if they don't understand the inheritance of this condition. It's important for people to understand that men and women in the family uh, have an equal risk of inheriting the mutations. So, you know, if your mother has a mutation, even if your father has a mutation, each of their children has a 50-50 risk, no matter whether it came from a man or woman. And men can also pass this along to their daughters um, as well as their sons. It's just that the cancer risks are significantly different for men and women, and we'll talk a bit about those details in a moment. And as we just talked about, women can inherit this condition from their father's side of the family. We've heard numerous stories in the past about, you know, women who've gone to their health care providers and said, you know, I'm really concerned about my dad's side of the family um, and health care providers in the past, and hopefully we're changing or, uh, you know, working towards uh, greater education about this, but they may have been told in the past that their father's side of the family wasn't as important as their mother's, and that's really not the case, um, especially with a condition like hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And again, you know, I think sharing resources may help you to be the first to, to give them some information that may help aid in their decision to test um, and where to be tested. So BRCA1 and 2, this picture just to orient you is of the chromosomes that are in the cells of our body. And we have two copies of each chromosome, one from our mothers and one from our fathers. The BRCA chromosomes sit on chromosome 17 for BRCA1 and chromosome 13 for BRCA2. When an individual has hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, they have a mutation in one copy of either of these genes. It's not common for people to have mutations in both BRCA1 and 2, although that certainly has happened in some families, um, but that's a bit of a mu more unique situation, and it's very uncommon um, for people to have mutations in both copies of a particular gene, for instance, two mutations in BRCA1. That's um, very, very unlikely. Um, so in general, an individual has a, has a mutation in one copy of either BRCA1 or BRCA2. So just to um, sort of get our language on the same page here, um, you know, we talk about the development of hereditary cancer and how is that different, if it is, from the development of sporadic cancer. And we think a lot in, in cancer genetics about the difference between non-hereditary and hereditary risk for cancer. We know that the vast majority of breast and ovarian cancers are sporadic, um, up to about 10%, which is certainly a significant amount of breast and ovarian cancer um, is hereditary. So if we talk about non-hereditary forms, it's really damage that can happen to the cells over time. And both copies of a particular gene um, get damaged or sort of knocked out over time, and that's when a cancer can develop in that particular tissue. However, if someone has a hereditary risk for cancer, they're born with a mutation that uh, gets them a step closer to developing cancer in particular tissues because they have that predisposition or that gene mutation in all the cells of their body. And so that's why we tend to see some of these cancers at earlier ages in individuals who have this hereditary risk. It's not always earlier, and again, we'll talk about a bit more detail about that, um, but certainly they, they have this predisposition, and that, that's what differentiates it. So we say, in, you know, uh, oftentimes with, with families that all cancer is genetic, or excuse me, all cancer is, um, yes, genetic, because it's caused by changes in genes, but only some cancers are hereditary, meaning those, that those changes in the genes are actually inherited from parent to child. So here's just a rundown, um, just sort of some uh, ranges of numbers of risk that have been um, put in the literature based on what are the risks associated with having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So you may have heard these numbers if you've had testing, if you have a mutation, but the Risk for developing breast cancer in individuals who have a BRCA mutation, if they're female, is between 50 and 85 percent over the lifetime. And about half of those occur uh, before age 50 or around the time of menopause. So about half are premenopausal, about half are postmenopausal. So you can see it's not only the early breast cancers 
um, that are seen with this. And then there's also increased risk for second primary breast cancer. So if someone can have two breast cancers, um, you know, either in the same breast or in the other breast. Um, and that risk, if, if you have a BRCA mutation, is between 40 and 60 percent over the lifetime. So some people use that information to decide, for instance, if they have breast cancer, whether or not they might want to have the other breast removed preventatively. Um, and then ovarian cancer risk is anywhere between 10 and 45 percent. That differs a bit depending on if you have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation in your family. Um, both have very significant risks for ovarian cancer, but statistically, uh, BRCA1 has a bit higher of a risk than BRCA2, but with either gene mutation, uh, with either gene having a mutation, there are very significant risks of ovarian cancer compared to baseline, which is only about 1 to 2 percent over the lifetime. And then there also are other cancer risks that can be associated with BRCA mutation. So male breast cancer is one that's certainly above baseline. Um, prostate cancer risk, uh, there are some families where we see an increased risk of pancreatic cancer and also melanomas. Um, so those numbers there, RR stands for relative risk, if you're looking at the slides. Um, so those are sort of compared to the general population with the relative risk or how many fold risk there is for developing those particular cancers. So talking about some of the management recommendations, and this may be a review for some of you who've been through this process, but just um, in case it wasn't applicable to you or in case you're not someone who's been through this process yet. Um, certainly, we talk about a few different um, opportunities for management for this condition. The first is increased surveillance. So for breast cancer surveillance, um, for instance, we recommend starting this earlier in people who have BRCA mutations. Um, so it depends a bit on the age of diagnosis in the family, but um, definitely by age 25. Um, we would recommend getting annual mammograms as well as annual breast MRIs. There's not great data about the timing of whether you do this together or separately, but we often recommend doing them every six months. Uh, we also recommend frequent clinical breast exams, so twice a year by a knowledgeable healthcare provider, as well as self-breast exams on a monthly basis. Okay. I just want to make sure you all could still hear me, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. It says I might be having network connection difficulties. I just want to make sure that wasn't the case. <laughs> okay, so and then with regard to surveillance for ovarian cancer, we're not quite there yet with having a gold standard test for surveillance for screening um, for ovarian cancer. You may, may be aware that people who have had ovarian cancer um, can follow that cancer with using what's called a CA125 level, and that's a validated test in that setting. But for people who haven't had ovarian cancer, we don't know how useful this test is. There hasn't been data to say that it saves lives yet um, in combination with a TVUS or a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, so that is an option for women, um, but we'll also talk about the recommendation that, um, that they may choose to pursue surgical risk reduction for their ovaries and fallopian tubes. We'll get to that in a moment. Chemo prevention really is um, sort of a big word for uh, are there medications that can help us to reduce risk of cancer in these families or in individuals. Um, tamoxifen is a medication, again, that's been um, really well studied in the setting of people who've had breast cancer to prevent a recurrence of breast cancer, but it also has been um, studied well in women who are at increased risk of breast cancer and can help um, reduce the risk. So that is an option for some BRCA carriers. Also, birth control pills. Um, there's been historical controversy about whether or not that might increase breast cancer risk, although there's some good data to say that in BRCA carriers, it, it likely doesn't increase breast cancer risk all that significantly. And it actually does, um, taking birth control pills for a significant amount of time, actually significantly reduces the risk of getting ovarian cancer. So all of these options have pros and cons and certainly need to be discussed thoroughly and considered thoroughly. Um, but there are options for, um, for management. So in terms of surgical uh, intervention, prophylactic mastectomy is a choice that some people choose um, either after they've had a breast cancer and they want to remove the other, either that, you know, that, um, the breast that's affected and the other breast, or if someone chooses to do this um, completely prophylactically um, before they've developed a breast cancer, that's an option. So having prophylactic mastectomy reduces the risk of breast cancer by about 90 percent. 
It removes the vast majority, but certainly not every cell, um, not all the breast tissue. Um, and there have been some, uh, some good follow-up studies, about 14 years in follow-up, that say that it significantly reduces um, the breast cancer risk in women with a family history. Um, and the generally what's, um, what's practiced now is what's called a total simple mastectomy. And also surgical intervention for the ovaries. Um, this is something, again, and, uh, we don't have great screening for ovarian cancer at this time that's uh, strongly recommended. And so um, we do recommend that once women are between 35 and 40 and once they're finished having children of their own, um, that they consider having their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed. Um, it's really a, a very effective way up to about a 95% risk reduction for the gynecologic cancers associated with this, which is really um, ovarian um, as well as fallopian tube cancers. But there is still a risk, a small risk, um, about uh, a 4 to 5 percent risk of developing what's called primary peritoneal cancer, even if someone's had their ovaries removed. So again, it doesn't take the risk to zero, um, but there is, uh, you know, a risk. It does greatly reduce the risk. The tubes, uh, this is something that if you're having a traditional oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries, they might not remove the fallopian tubes, but it's strongly um, recommended in this setting if someone has a BRCA mutation because um, there's some theory that some of the ovarian cancers might actually start in the fallopian tubes. Um, and also it's really important, about 2% of women who go in thinking they're having a preventative removal of the ovaries or oophorectomy um, will have what's called an occult or silent cancer at the time of that surgery. So it's important that the pathologists really look closely at that tissue. And again, these are not details that generally a patient needs to be concerned about, but also something you want to make sure um, that you are advocating for yourself and understanding what's happening at the time of surgery. So if um, someone is having a prophylactic oophorectomy premenopausally, it actually provides some protection against breast cancer risk. So removing that large source of estrogen um, greatly reduces, or excuse me, has a significant reduction, about a 53% reduction in breast cancer risk, again, if it's done premenopausally. All right, so moving on with how to share this information. So there's really no right or wrong way to share the information with your family, um, particularly your test results. Um, you know your family best, and so, you know, I think these uh, recommendations can sort of be a guide. Um, but certainly I would, you know, recommend doing what makes sense for your particular family members, and that may differ depending on the particular relative. Um, so, you know, thinking about, approach, you know, considering how close you are with a particular relative, what are the family dynamics with that relative, um, how far away are they from you, um, and how are you most comfortable communicating with others? How do you feel like you're, you're most comfortable sharing information? And again, I think just preparing yourself, thinking through what information you need to share and how best to convey that information is really the best place to start. So this could be one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, sharing it, uh, you know, either, you know, over coffee or over dinner or something like that. Um, or it could be in a larger group setting uh, with family members. Um, it could be by telephone, could be by email. And, you know, certainly if you're uneasy, I would encourage you to talk with your um, your provider who has experience with this, because we are certainly here to help. This is just an example of a letter that, you know, you might consider sending to a family member, um, some text that we thought might be of use, you know, letting them know that you've had testing done, um, that it's their decision to even find out more about what you've had done, that you might share the results in an enclosed sealed envelope or something like that so that they have the choice. Um, you know, it may be that a lot of your family members know you were going through this process already and maybe be asking you for the results right away, but others, this may be um, very new information for them and certainly I think just sort of easing them into the process, allowing them the choice of when they, you know, really see all this information uh, might help to, for them to feel empowered about making decisions going forward. So I'm going to pass it on to Kristen now who's going to talk more specifically about Check Your Genes and the family notification tool that has been developed. Kristen, I cannot hear you. It's 
Sorry about that. Now, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you now. Okay. All right, moving forward. So I have the honor of having been involved um, with Check Your Genes during the development of the Family History Notification Tool. And really, the main impetus behind developing the Family History Notification Tool was just that as genetics professionals, we knew um, that there were large portions of the time in which patients were having difficulty um, or were feeling very limited in their ability to communicate this information with their family members. Um, we know, you know, that the patients who have the greatest risk of having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation are going to be those that are directly related to individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. As a brand new genetic counselor more than a decade ago, um, probably one of my first patients that, that I ever counseled and tested who came back positive for a BRCA2 mutation, you know, went about her way. She was actually a healthcare professional herself. So she did a really good job of informing her immediate family members. Um, and, you know, a few people from her family got tested. And about four to five years after that, I met another patient, a 26-year-old with a very aggressive triple negative breast cancer. Um, and it turned out that this individual, my second, the second patient, was about a sixth degree relative to that original patient that I had tested years before. Um, and it wasn't that, you know, there was any error on anyone's part, it's just that sometimes we don't think of how far out our relatives are that we should perhaps be concerned about. Um, and really there was a very direct link between the cancers for these two women and ultimately the 26 year old did not survive for breast cancer. Um, so this is very important information for us to be able to help families to spread as far as possible. Hence the Family Notification Service. So the Family Notification Service was originally designed for patients with positive BRCA results. Um, and it's really to kind of help streamline the process for patients. They've obviously just gone through um, the difficult period of time learning that they have a mutation. They're making a lot of management decisions about their own care and now they have this additional burden of needing to notify as many family members as possible. Um, so Check Your Genes developed the secure, free family notification service to help patients directly to notify their family members about their test results. So this is a screenshot of the entry page of the family notification service. And so from this, you'll see um, that we have a little bit of a welcome page that lives on the Check Your Genes website. And we just ask that our patients who will be returning to the website enter in their email address and create their own password so that this is something that is secure and private for the individual patient. Once you have created your information and login password, it does ask you for a little bit of information about yourself. Um, really, the highest degree um, of privacy, kind of location-wise, is just your zip code and state. And this is all, as I had mentioned, done completely securely. And then you enter into the home section. Now, what you'll find on this section are templates that are very similar to the one that Sarah went over as a suggestion as to how you might communicate with your family members. So we have established a couple of different templates that you can work from. You can utilize them in one of two ways. They are set up so that you could merge names into them and print them out. Um, and mail to your family members who um, might be more easily communicated with by mail. And then we also have email templates as well. The email templates can be set up to uh, be sent directly out to your family members. So this is an example of the opportunity to edit one of the templates. So it comes with a subject line. Now, the default subject line that is in there does say urgent, I tested positive for BRCA1 and 2 in one of the two options. And that might be, you know, a little concerning for some of your family members. So you, you might um, change the subject. It's completely at your discretion. But really this is a very significant issue that we do want our patients and their family members um, to know about. And so it will the email body then loads and you'll see dear where it says hashtag hashtag recipient. That will 
self-populate based on the family members' names that you enter in. And then there's an amount of text that you can change. Um, and then you close and save any changes that you've made to the template. The template that we have in there does have the Genetic Counselor Finder tool, which is, lives on the NSGC, or the National Society of Genetic Counselors template. That is a helpful tool because it can actually help people to locate genetic counselors within a radius of their home, uh, which might help them with the type of information. Now, you have multiple template options. Um, you can save as many of your own templates as you'd like. You can actually basically start from scratch. You can use some of the sample letter templates that we start with. Um, some of the sample templates that we have in there, one is called positive result letter. This means these are family members that you are comfortable being direct with, you know, and it basically says, I had genetic testing and my test result is this. You are at risk for this mutation and you may wish to talk to your medical professional as soon as possible or at your convenience. The second one is called family increased risk leader letter and this might be better for patients who are slightly more comfortable um, with a more vague statement but still want to inform their family members of potential risk. So the family increased risk letter talks a little bit more about the fact that a patient has perhaps been diagnosed with a breast cancer or recognizes that breast and or ovarian cancer runs in their family and they want their family members to be aware that that is something that can impact their health as well. So it's you know much more gentle, it's not as specific and direct in mentioning a particular um, genetic mutation. And then at the bottom, towards the bottom where the arrow is, you'll see that you can save multiple templates um, for the different levels of comfort with your various um, close and extended family. Um, and, and after that, you'll enter in your contact details. So who is this going out to? So that first name, last name, that part where it's required, that's used to basically self-populate those letters. So dear mom, this happened. Um, and then you kind of indicate for here, and there's a way to help yourself to keep track of whether or not you're emailing this information out to particular family members or whether it's going by regular mail. So you'll say, now if it's going by a regular mail, you'll have to print that out yourself. There's not, you know, a magical mechanism by which it arrives at your printer. So you, you would be responsible for the printing and mailing part. But the emailing part, the tool will take care of for you. In addition to some of the functionality we've described, it is also possible to attach a PDF of your test report. So everyone who's having testing at this point in time, your genetic counselor or your healthcare provider who has ordered that test for you, is probably getting your test result one of two ways. Um, most are still actually getting it by, both by fax to their office and then a PDF copy by email or by a secure portal as well. So if you contacted your healthcare provider, um, especially for testing that has been done in 2012, 13 and on, um, we all pretty much have a PDF copy of your result um, that we could certainly very easily make accessible to you. And for genetic counselors who may be watching, moving forward, you know, obviously this is something you can discuss with your patients up front, the availability of the PDF to provide to them that they may wish uh, to readily share with their family members. So you'll go ahead and attach that. And then really it's as simple as just have three buttons, send your emails. Um, so you click send emails and they magically arrive in the inboxes of your family members. So when to share. The sooner the information is shared, the better. Really, a delay in sharing the information can result in the diagnosis of another family member. Um, and the whole goal, the whole goal, really, of having this type of information is try to, to try to prevent cancer diagnosis. I mean, Jim said it best in the beginning. Really, the goal of Check Your Genes is to make people aware so that we can do something about the overall incidence of cancer. And really, it's a very personal issue for the families of our patients. Um, and it's just devastating to hear that there's another individual who has been diagnosed um, because we hope that with the knowledge and some opportunities for prevention and additional choices um, that cancer can be prevented. We do um, talk with our patients about being mindful that genetic testing is not typically recommended for minors um, and therefore this information is generally to be shared with adult family members. Um, in BRCA1 and 2 we do often take into account the age of diagnosis of a patient and um, so, you know, for example, that family I mentioned in the beginning, where my second patient was 26. In that family, although we would typically start BRCA1 and 2 management at about age 25, we started with the other girls in that family between the ages of 16 and 18, or about 10 years younger than their youngest diagnosis.
There are genetic conditions, um, particular uh, polyposis uh, cancer, colon cancer syndrome, in which we do test minors and consider some other options. Um, but for a condition like BRCA1 and 2, it's really a concern of adult onset. So we're primary talk, primarily talking about your adult family members. After sharing, when you're undergoing the process of sharing the test result, it's important to respect your family members' decisions about testing. Um, we've been running a support group here in Cincinnati for a number of years, and I know that a lot of our um, mothers and, and fathers of adult children are often very concerned about the choices that their adult children are making, whether or not to test, the timing of testing. Um, so it's very important for the individual who's going to have the test to be comfortable that this is information that they want to have rather than feel as though they're being rushed into a decision. Um, so we really encourage family members to think through a positive test result um, and a negative test result and what different types of actions they would take with that type of information. We want to give family members time um, to speak with their own medical professionals in help them to become informed. Um, and also, you know, you are sharing this information with them. I think it's important to have a little bit of dialogue, too, about whether you're open to reciprocity. Is this something that you want to continue to discuss as a family? Um, and the, really, one of the most important things is it's important not to pressure any family members in decision making one way or the other. There are studies that have looked at surgical decision making and other things that women may do after learning of a diagnosis. Um, and generally, the individuals who feel certain that they want to have a mastectomy tend to be those that are the happiest with their decision to have a mastectomy um, afterwards. And so it's very important for people to be in a place where they're comfortable with the decisions they might make on the basis of a genetic test result. After sharing, there is also um, some report of noticing a potential change in family dynamics. Some family members may become closer uh, than before because of their genetic status. I have a family um, also, though, that I've been working with recently where uh, the mother had passed away from an ovarian cancer, you know, and a number of family members were coming back positive, and I finally got a daughter who came back negative. She had three daughters herself, so this was tremendous news for her nuclear family. And her exact words to me were, it feels kind of crummy. Um, and there is a real phenomenon called survivor guilt, where our patients do um, experience guilt about not inheriting the increased risk for cancer when they have tested negative. Um, so there's a lot that goes on in terms of emotions and family dynamics and the psychosocial issues that surround families. Um, so it's important to be prepared for that when you're at a point where you're sharing this critical information. That is about the limitation of what we were going to discuss on the family notification tool. I was going to move quickly into a little bit of other information that comes up fairly often in terms of things that patients wonder about. Um, and so quickly, I'll just kind of go through the information on the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So I think one of the things um, that family members sometimes might ask you about is, um, well, isn't it going to set me up for discrimination in insurance or discrimination in employment if I am to have a genetic test. You know, what can happen with this information? Um, and so HIPAA, which is um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, is a privacy law that's been in account for a number of years, since like 2006 or 2008, um, in which some degree of protection existed. Um, and then GINA was which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, really bolstered what HIPAA had said previously. And basically, these laws prohibit the use of genetic information in making um, health insurance or in employment decisions. It really restricts employers um, and other covered entities from requesting, requiring, or purchasing um, genetic information, and it limits the disclosure of genetic information. Um, so it does provide employment protection they can, an employer cannot use a genetic test result to, um, in consideration of hiring, firing, promotions, wages, benefits. Um, they really cannot request or require that a patient engage in any type of genetic test. And then health insurance, of course. So health insurance, basically the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act 
indicates that a genetic test result cannot be used as a pre-existing condition. It cannot be used to restrict enrollment, to adjust individual premiums, contribution, or coverage on the basis of a genetic test result. Um, the insurance company can't request or require genetic testing. They can't really, you know, there's just basically not opportunity to discriminate against someone on the basis of a genetic test result. Um, Sadly, you know, we've had patients over the years who knew that there was a mutation in their family members and had heard the rumors that discrimination is something that can be an issue for individuals and decided not to have testing for that reason. And the saddest thing that can possibly happen is when that individual then is later diagnosed with a cancer because, you know, that is something that is obviously very serious for the individual and for all of their family members and it's really avoidable insurance is not something that should be an issue of concern at all. Are there any questions that anyone has? I did see a question earlier. Let me pop that back open. Oh, it looks like somebody wrote an answer to it. Okay, but I'll share it in case anyone else was wondering the same thing. Um, Actually, Chris, I just mentioned that we might, uh, you know, I was going to just let you know I said we uh, touch base about that question at the end, so I didn't answer it yet. But the question really was, um, at what age, let me get back to it here, at what age might um, prophylactic mastectomy be recommended in someone who tests positive for uh, a mutation? I'm just trying to get back to that question, but I think it said a BRCA2 mutation um, if they've tested in their 20s. I didn't know if you wanted to address that or if you'd like for me to. If you, want, you can go ahead. That's great. Sure. So there's really no standard recommended age to have prophylactic mastectomies. Um, that's, you know, there's not um, a particular age that's recommended. I think for a lot of people it really depends, you know, on when they're ready to do that in their life. So, you know, some people feel uh, very strongly about, you know, making sure that they um, wait until they breastfed their children. Some people really feel uncomfortable with waiting because of maybe the ages of onset in their family. Um, but there's really not great data to tell us um, exactly when someone should. And I think that's just because it just really does vary so much. And as Kristen mentioned, um, those who do choose to pursue prophylactic mastectomies um, who are most satisfied with it are really those who are very ready for that procedure. Um, Kristen, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add. No, I think, yeah, exactly like you're saying. It's a difficult, it's obviously such a personal choice. And I, I'm sorry, are you getting feedback now? Okay. It's such a personal choice and, you know, whereas we do have actually maybe more guidelines about a good time for considering something like a prophylactic oophorectomy or removing the ovaries. I think we're a little bit more clear with our patients on the fact that, you know, if we if a patient is presenting to us and is diagnosed with a mutation and they are 50 years old, there is not a ton of good for keeping those ovaries at that point in time. We are certainly a little bit more directive because of our ability to diagnose ovarian cancer um, at an early stage, not being quite as good as our ability to diagnose breast cancer at an early stage. Um, and that gives a little bit more leeway in the timing of prophylactic mastectomy if that's something that a patient is considering. Great job, Kristen. Great job, Sarah. Okay, we're going to open up the open up for questions now. And while we're waiting for the questions to come in, uh, Sarah, if you would comment about why this is not just a female issue, why this is a family issue. I can't hear you, Sarah. Can you, you know what? That. <laughs> okay. So there are often questions about. Okay. There are a lot of questions about what this does mean for the men in the family, um, and a lot of times the men that may come to us for testing, part of their motivation may be for the the women in their family who this may directly impact. So they might be most concerned about you know, their daughters and sons or their granddaughters, things like that. But there are risks associated with men having a BRCA mutation. So in particular, we talked about the, um, uh, the risk for male breast cancer. And so that is above baseline. Um, and there are, you know, in men who have breast tissue, some recommendations for regular um, mammogram in that population, but certainly doing regular self uh, chest exam and having a doctor do that as well. Um, certainly close prostate screening 
Um, and then depending on the family history, there may also be a role in men and women for pancreatic um, uh, cancer uh, discussion about whether or not there are methods for screening for pancreatic cancer that might be appropriate in that family. There's no specific recommendation for that at this point, um, but we are offering uh, that to some families. Um, and melanoma, um, you know, that can be a, a, an associated risk, although everyone probably has a history of sun exposure. Um, those who have BRCA mutations should probably be particularly um, good about sunscreen, um, as well as maybe getting regular skin exams. Great. Kristen, would you address, we had a great conversation at our last board meeting about the new testing options and, the, and for those families that show a family history of breast or ovarian cancer but test negative for the BRAC gene? Sure, absolutely, Jim. This is a population that's been of great concern to us for a number of years. We, um, you know, have families in which we are obviously concerned that there is a particular genetic mutation that's putting our patients at risk, um, yet when we tested them for BRCA1 and 2, originally perhaps we were not able to identify a mutation. So there's really kind of two different categories of an answer to this question. Individuals that were tested for BRCA1 and 2 prior to 2006 may not have had what we consider to be comprehensive uh, complete testing at this point in time. So today we offer a test that includes full sequencing of BRCA1 and BRCA2 as well as deletion duplication rearrangement studies. So it's really just two methodologies of looking at the genes um, in two slightly different ways but that provide us with a little bit of a difference in terms of information. So if a family had testing prior to 2006 and has not been evaluated since, they may actually be appropriate and eligible for additional rearrangement studies of BRCA1 and 2. If they had that type of testing and it was complete and was negative, but there are still additional cancers of concern in their family, um, there are a number of other hereditary cancer genes that are involved in the development of breast cancer. So certain families may have breast cancer as a primary feature, but may have additional cancers that we don't really see in BRCA1 and 2. So for example, a family with a lot of breast and thyroid and uterine, we might consider a different condition called Cowden syndrome due to P10 mutations. Um, in 2013, there was really a rapid expansion of the types of genetic testing that were available and the technology that was used. So there's a newer technology called next generation sequencing, uh, which is able to rapidly look at a number of genes at lower cost than we were previously experiencing. Um, and it looks like this might be answering a question that has popped up, so I'll kind of cover this. And the question is, what is the cost of genetic testing and is it typically covered by insurance? But Sarah, would you, you, I mean, Kristen, would you go back on the webcam um, yes, for this sorry. response? Thank you. Sure. Am I back on? I'm seeing the question slide. Yes, you are. You You're back on. Okay. okay. So with the next generation sequencing, what we're now able to offer is BRCA1 and 2 in conjunction with a number of additional genes. So there are multiple gene panels. It really is very specialized testing, so it's very important for a genetics professional or someone who's very familiar with multiple and more rare hereditary cancer syndromes to look at your family history in a great degree of detail to assess what lab and what technology uh, might be best in terms of a panel that might fit the particular pattern of cancer in your family. So there are multiple hereditary cancer gene panels that are now available, many of which include BRCA1 and 2, and many of which cover, cover other hereditary cancer syndromes. So there are families out there that we really haven't touched on tonight that might have you know, a colon and mitral uterine cancer syndrome. Um, and we certainly have lots of different testing options available for those families as well. To so what is, the cost, what is the cost of the test, and is it covered by insurance? Yes, so the answer to that question, um, the cost of genetic testing has really um, decreased rapidly in the past year. Um, we can now get BRCA1 and 2 at a list price of about $2,000, but with multiple labs, the vast majority of patients with private insurance are paying between zero and $100. So since July of last year, I personally have not had a patient who had an estimated out-of-pocket greater than $100 uh, for BRCA1 and 2 testing and for some of those tests that have the panels on them. Now, with the panel genes, when we're testing for anywhere from 6 to 22 genes, 
those tests do get more pricey, more in the three to four thousand dollar list price. Um, but with certain labs and the options that are out there, I would still stand by that even with the panels, the vast majority of patients are experiencing great insurance coverage. Actually, the Affordable Care Act mandates BRCA1 and 2 testing as one of the 22 preventive services for women that insurance companies are required to provide. So we've had um, great luck with getting this covered. The only caveat to that um, would be federal programs such as Medicare. Medicare has slightly stricter rules um, with requiring that a patient has had a diagnosis. They don't do as much testing for unaffected family members um, for Medicare. However, if we have an unaffected family member who's on Medicare, our primary motivation for testing them is probably that there's already another family member that has a mutation. And so we're really talking about an out-of-pocket expense between one and $400. That's not a very expensive test either. So um, it does tend to be covered by insurance. It's actually to some degree required to be covered by insurance, and so coverage is quite good. Great job on that answer. Thanks, I, I don't see any other questions, and we're closing in on our one-hour allotment. Um, I just had one other comment, if you don't mind, Jim. Absolutely, Sarah. Absolutely, Sarah. I wonder if people might be wondering how to find a genetic counselor, and I know that Check Your Genes has a link to the National Society of Genetic Counselors tool to do that. Um, so if you go to the Check Your Genes website, you can actually uh, link to that, and you can search by zip code or, um, uh, you know, city or particular specialty for a genetic counselor, and I just, I just thought that might be helpful to mention. Absolutely. Well, with that, I think we'll call it a night. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank Sarah and Kristen for taking time out of their evening uh, to volunteer and to present at this webinar. I want to thank all the participants and attendees for the webinar for coming out and listening to this medically accurate and life-saving information. And I want you to go out to the community around you and ask the people that you see, does breast or ovarian cancer run in your family? And if the answer is yes, encourage them to seek out genetic counseling and to get tested. With that, I want to thank everybody. God bless. Have a great night.